first speaker today is named Drew Zaba, and he's a junior at Tufts University studying art history and linguistics, largely focusing on temp contemporary visual culture. Drew is also involved in work at local community arts, nonprofits, and galleries, and he's also a board member of the Tufts Art History Society. This conference, I kind of want to talk about absent objects and non objects, and how we build those histories in relation to materials and materiality, and how we can only do that through you know, their reified contingencies that exist as sort of the things that we have found as indexes to our indices to deal with. Um, so, yeah. So, looking at for medieval Scandinavia is an exercise of absence. None remains with some archaeological shards. Well, this points to what could have been the empty spaces and images that the seas with links to the context and locales that are functioning. It isn't the thing itself. What does exist, of course, are the animals alive today. Um, the bones of animals from which the fur was skin can last to sagas and texts describing fur sit edged in pelts. Traces and reshapings of the earth itself by fur trade and fur making off the north. Or even a handful of images as well. The 14th um, century wooden Sutherabha church in southern Sweden was painted around the wall on the inside. There are images of monstrous devilish creatures, all hair, pigs jousting, of course, their fur is contacting fur, and infantrymen in fur armor. Infantrymen. Uh, funnily enough, this is an absent index too. The church burned down in 2001. Um, into that all along in these images and disappearances is a sense of the strange transitionality of fur, simultaneously belonging to animals, but also to the monstrous and to humans as well. The space between non-human and non-human shifts into uncertainty. When fur is put on the body, the very acts of dressing and undressing can be transformative and uncanny representation of selfhood. It's a reflexive self second skin you cannot become with. So here I want to present a notion of transformation that is not merely social or symbolic. Um, but rather one that understands the multiple reciprocal interactions of the various actions, be they people and bodies, or the very fur in its material upon the body and the world. They are all too part of a system of interaction that must be understood. And this potent transformative reality comes from the after stuff of animal life, the vibrant matter cut into cloak or worn as gloves. And this stuff has a sense of time left on itself. It must be taken from the animal, stretched and scraped and cured, and so on. It might be passed on or it might be buried with someone, yet it eventually decays. Its object could have lost necessarily because of its material properties. Bones are scattered and dislocated. The animal body is reimagined and transposed onto the human self. And through all these interactions, one might not be able to localize the single origin to say where the transformation or translation spreads out of, where it comes back onto itself, where this sort of power of it originates. Thus, while I look at the materiality for its principal interest, I want to acknowledge a distributed agency that we might only circle about, a polyvalence that can't be answered but only trouble to explore, something in the space between garment and skin and animal and human, object and subject, where these relevancies too decay. So, um, oftentimes ways of knowing about the Viking past are through landscapes of death. One of the principal ways of changing the landscape of the North Atlantic like, was through burial mounds that would have surrounded Viking people and led to a cause of reimagining them into the phenomenon Through these landscapes of death, we discover Bertha, an uh, 8th century southern Swedish town is filled with fur related alterations. In fact, osteological remains such as fur was foundational to its existence from beginning to end. It's a landscape haunted by human death as much as by haunted animal. Although cremation was the most common death, common death custom, it often involved a small burial mound. And this landscape of death and ritual indicates the social transformative nature of fur. The way that placing fur against oneself and emerging into the world, or out of it, as the case may be in a death ritual, um, can signify class. The ways different animals are cut, treated, discarded, and regarded suggests something about the nature of how people relate to these creatures and to the spaces from where they come from. It also suggests who moved around where and what, what the translation between a person pelt an animal does to the person, and what meaning was made within these environments. The way that fur was used by whom said a tremendous deal about their social allowances. Furs wearing itself constituted on social bodies, and this thus allowing for the emergence of transformations from material to social. Fur reifies social economic identity. In Burka, this presents itself in two distinct ways. 
those of um, lesser means would uh, likely wear garments of different hides, so from badger or wolf or hare. Um, also, depending on their class status, the garment may be more representative of the original animal shape, um, taking advantage of the anatomical correspondences between the human and animal, the material practicality rather than the aesthetic associations predominating. Even still, the fur garment of many animals matched together in color and texture seems to be the marker of upper classes, thus the less animal sort of form can only supersede pure function as long as the means to care. Although the other, uh, this is just a burial, um, the other perhaps more unique and interesting way the classing of fur makes itself visible, at least to historians, and some of this may do purely to what archaeological remains are secure, um, is in grave sites. Some lavish burial sites featured numerous artifacts, as well as fur remains or bones from furred animals, which coincide only with these types of sites. This suggests that there's a specificity in the animal from which the fur comes, fur itself comes from, that presents class in these ceremonies and transforms these individuals in social space in particular ways. Additionally, the fur of certain animals, such as bears, are more, are more, is more present in wealthy people's clothing or grave sites. And here, our head of state is always in death. Again, constructing material differences that would have required very difficult or dangerous hunting and repair. At times, the fur in these graves wrap the bodies as opposed to being used like a garment, suggesting that its purpose was in some way specific to the ritual. Um, and through this total situation of objects and their performance and the people present, there's a transformation of the site and the bodies into constructions of class of individuals. Um, one of the things that I think is especially interesting, and for time I think I might condense this, but just to speak, um, especially I, in this image, while we don't have fur, what often happened is it interacted with objects that were left in the burial mounds. So there might be a piece of fur left on, like a gold piece like that. And I think this is especially interesting to consider the combinatorial power of materials and what sort of agency and power materials can have over time, um, especially in the light of the ideas of vibrant matter in political theorist Jane Bennett's terms, and sort of what sort of different power do scrambled together garments have in contradistinction to the power of these things interacting over time as we go to see them. And additionally, considering these assemblages, I think we can consider how fur and objects have inter interacted together in these real sites. Um, and so archaeologists can identify from what animals these come from. We can speculate about the context these existed in, but I think here it is most fruitful to consider the way fur and its very materiality, by serving as part of its animation situations, has continued to act and interact upon the materials that coexist with it, to combine its agencies and powers in the site to render not a new, but shifted composite reality in itself. Additionally, the Norse sagas uh, describe an invisible world where magic is implicit to reality. Vulva, plural, vulva, is a soothsaying woman simultaneously feared and revered who could be found in these Christian era stories of the pagan Viking past. They are often depicted walking around from place to place in the fold, fur gloves and robe on, and importantly, fur hood. Important because the fur hood has generally been, under gen generally been understood as a garment coated as male, coming up against and sleep, slipping into the female coated magic that gives these impressive women their reality shift and agency. And this is to say that fur is present whenever um, time collapses in on itself. When a prophetess reverses gloves and reverses her skin, and skin meets the world, reality is just to meet her in some slippage of these in betweennesses now. Um, so in the East Ending or Sugar, which are the sagas of the Isenberg, um, there's a demonstration of a great deal of supernatural happenings. But the, these are also the more common folk tales that are generally regarded as more realistic, suggesting that the cultural salience of magic goes beyond the purely literary. And it should be noted there are also burial mounds out of place sorceresses with staffs and magic wands. So this seems to be something that was actually thought to have occurred in this worldview. And magic is here a crucial narrative element. And in the terms of literary historian of my Catherine Fubert's daughter's scholarship, it's linked to Weber's definition of power and love. Notably, this magic is often the domain of prophecies and sorceresses. It's the will to power and display of agency for many women. Here I'll take a special interest in third year of Eric Sagaruda, committed to Bellin in the 14th and 15th centuries, at first based off a 13th century saga depicting events that would have taken place around the 10th century. And I'll do so in order to investigate where fur drum and may lay and her abilities to transform the seeming complacency of the present through her magical capabilities. Oh, I did not see that. <coughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, I fear this is actually a reenactor. I can't stop it. Um, 
So Eric Sargariva documents the expulsion of Eric the Great to Greenland, and later the Eric sends incursion to what's about to be present-day Newfoundland. But in this saga, perhaps in the Eastern Settlement, we encounter um, the quote-unquote little part of this, Thorbjörg. Um, and so the settlement had found itself in a famine. In this dire situation, the th farmer th comes to Thorbjörg, um, the only remaining Boba with her sisters all dead. When she arrives in the evening to foretell the heart, harvest of Thorbjörg, so he can make plans, she is changed for the occasion. She wears a blue cloak decorated with stones and glass. Um, she carries a staff cast with bronze and stones, a, pelt, a belt with a car sculpt to her charms, and cast skin shoes with large tin knobs on the laces. Of interest here, however, is her black lambskin coat lined with white cat skin and her cat skin gloves. Also white on the inside, thus presumably the black or brown outers. Um, perhaps also animalistically noteworthy that she must sit on a cloak chicken feathers. This attention to the color of the fur and the multiple contacts thereof illustrates the degree of interiority and exteriority of known and unknown and bodily and animal contact. The garment here sits somewhere between. It is very much out to the world, but also it has a little home it makes with the head or the hand. Here is the space of difference, a different skin inside and out. Yet there is nothing solid or definite about this. The resoluteness decays when blood gets reversed. When one considers the assembled juncture where skin A meets skin B. And this isn't the only contact. The interior skin is against another open surface, the wearer. And of course, even more hypothetically, the wearer can touch and contact another. The dialectic of the unknown breaks down into a confused system of animal intimacy. There is that which can and cannot be seen at any given moment. The glove always has a hidden part, which may in fact change as it appears reversible garments were not unheard of in the sagas. This itself is a transformative potentiality. The idea of simultaneous, hidden, and easily legible material realities also seems to great, make a great deal of sense with the character of the real. Play is a mystical in between of the supernatural and the natural, in between the present and the future. The furs themselves are vibrant in their strange contact with other skins, both from Thorbjörg and other creatures on the garden. A reversal is an act in displacement, reenacting a performative difference of exposed body and hidden bodily contact. And yet this total outfit seems to unify into some character that she presents, it itself is assembled into mystic otherness. As textile historian Thor Ewing notes, um, there seems to be a strange duality between the practicality of the wanderer's clothes and the magic bound to them that still must be parsed apart. The saga's literary descriptions of furry materiality and clothing seem to be related to the very physical and non-verbal depiction of magic in the manuscripts. What people whom the sagas are about would have looked in town of utterances and charms, the Christian saga audience really saw it in the text directly, perhaps because these Christian scribes wouldn't, couldn't or felt it inappropriate to write, thus giving science in other ways, um, which is similarly done with when men slay other men. Um, and as Friedrich Pelter notes, um, magic is an important component of almost diverse agency for the sagas. This could be, could be a part of indicating the magical. However, so too could this material literality um, be beyond just a literary tool. We see also numerous examples of prediction, charms, and reality-altering spells. We also see an interesting belief for a close silver pendants in Denmark that appears in the um, Gulder, um, so prophecies, the goddess Freya, or the god Odin, whose um, feminine magic was depicted as a generally shameful conflation of gender bending and in sexological terms, homosexuality. And so, yes, this is probably good. And it seems that ritual, materiality, and garments all interact inextricably. This supports a theory of multiply embedded energetic transformations that plan for various reversible gloves and but and her ability to see past the singular present into a magical future. So for his absent self that only leaves the echo of its transformation that lies the space between human and non-human in the past and present. When first put on the body, the very acts of dressing and dressing possess potentiality as transfigured in representations of selfhood. Fur is a tricky product. To say that it's made by hand is to fool oneself. Sure, you might scrape off the animal with a knife or a fingernail and sew it all up into a couple or a couple hundred more pellets, but you can beat the fur. It begs the question of the animal's place. Those killed with limbs cast off in the forest are heads left on to look terrifying. Are those animals made to go extinct? In these violent moments, then, the animals and the people who kill and wear them are perpetually in the process of becoming something other, something new. The very contact and intimacy of tongue and garment making was real. And of course, the fur ends up against the body and skin anyway. It is worn, a skin.
skin to skin where intimate contact is necessary, a, a necessary and oh, is necessary and animal reality is remade as the human becomes a fuzzy boundary through the garment in the social magic in both in the entirely social magical and practical space. There's a constant uncanny reminder of, of from where the stuff came. Uncanny perhaps in its familiar familiarity that's decidedly proximal, both in terms of contact and a taxonomy to ourselves. We might be turned to the world, perhaps ditched to silk or fine wool, here an assemblage of different power and agency, or transformed and reconfigured yet again, re-symbolizing its own material self. For one to be transformed by fur, the fur had to first be trans had to be transformed in turn from the animal self into material other. Some textual shift on a path of liminal beastliness to be worked by hand and embodied in space in a multitude of ways. Its materiality projects transformations onto its users. Body, time, reality, identity, economy, earth shift to meet its material demands and react against the plane of its undeniably carnal surface. This is the only viscerality a historian can touch, the hyper object on its own space time scale. And here the bonds of human bounds of humanity and non humanity dissolve as fur comes onto our bodies from others or grows from our bodies and monstrous tails. And in turn, the fur itself decays into time, coalescing into a system of effective and material discourse that emerges beyond the animal and beyond the material itself. So, thank you. Our next speaker is named Daphne Taranto. She is a senior undergraduate student at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. She's a double major pursuing degrees in fine art and art history, theory, and criticism. Daphne is from New York and has a twin sister who attends the nearby art school, RISD, in Providence. Together, the sisters produce a multi-format publication and handmade editions that they publish twice a year. Each issue is a theme-based, is theme-based, draws submission from over 100 individuals, and is a collaborative effort between their campuses and cities. For the past year, Daphne has researched the contemporary art culture of the United Arab Emirates, where she hopes to travel and visit for the first time after graduating. Hello. The title of my paper is Under the Rug, Dreams and Extremes in the United Arab Emirates on Cold and Contemporary Art Culture. And this is a version of my thesis paper. So it's a short edition. So if you have further questions, I have a lot more to say after. <laughs> the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, is a country located on the Persian Gulf, surrounded by Oman, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Qatar. For a bit of background, the UAE gained independence from British rule in 1971. I'll repeat that, 1971. The country is just four decades old. Capitalizing on the benefits gained mostly from an oil-based economy, the UAE has urbanized at an incredible rate since the 1950s, when oil discoveries prompted investments in education and infrastructure, such as the first paved roads. Well before the colonial presence, the land was first settled in the late 18th and 19th centuries by Bedouins who used precious water sources to establish fishing villages and important trade routes. This is Dubai now, with the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, in the center. Today, the Emirates is rumored to hold a quarter of the world's cranes. That's a lot of cranes. As an Arab state of the Persian Gulf, the UAE is internationally famous or even notorious for its massive crude oil reserves and production. In the last two decades, the country's financial standing has enabled this construction of massive buildings at a quite rapid pace. Designed by world-renowned architects, these projects make a spectacle of the land and country itself, firmly placing the UAE as part of a global conversation concerning urbanism, culture, and tourism. Today I will focus on two of the country's seven total emirates, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. I'll now zoom in on Saadiyat Island, the government-supported island that is currently in development 500 meters off of Abu Dhabi's coast. It is set to house both the upcoming Guggenheim and Louvre Museum's branches, along with many other major cultural institutions. How many here have heard of Saudi Island before? 
Okay, so you're gonna hear a little more about him. It means happiness island in Arabic and will cost over $26 billion total as a government supported project. While there are many intriguing topics to discuss regarding the Emirates, this island is very much in the public eye and makes for a decent 15 minute conversation. You've probably heard about Sayyid Island in the news within the last couple of years, along with the many superlatives that follow the Emirates, such as the fact that Dubai holds both the world's tallest building and the world's largest shopping mall. This satellite image is from 2014, where you can see the roof of the Louvre just being installed. So this is essentially what it looks like now. As an active viewer of this country's ambitious current art activity, I question what we read, hear, and see as its audience. How do we assimilate the growing reputation and image of the country, and what is that image? Who says what about the contemporary art culture of the UAE, and how do they say it? A spectrum of authors use particular language to describe and discuss the country's art culture, its wealth, and the issues of workers' rights in Saudiat's construction. These sources range from curatorial statements to artist protests, scholarly essays, and newspaper articles. They also range in perspective, angle, and motive. This digital rendering shows the projected plan for Abu Dhabi's Saudiat Island in the year 2030. What is the purpose and intention of art and art collecting in the face of such financial ability? As Wally Rod, a Lebanese artist, stated in his talk at my art college, my goes last February, a billion dollars is Emirati pocket change. The written sources in question that I've analyzed either intensely criticize the extreme wealth of Abu Dhabi and Dubai, or they ignore any problematic concerns, waxing lyrical of the country and four decade history. These are pictures from past years of Art Week in Dubai, the Emirates' major Art Week of fairs each March. It's just concluding now. While the new island is hardly the country's only art outlet, Saudi Arts museums do give a name and a face to the UAE's otherwise highly developed, albeit criticized, regional culture of art and design. But the inescapable topic of money stirs questions. Beyond blueprints and digital renderings, how is all this being constructed, or more specifically, by whom? The New York Times published an article in May 2014 concerning the construction of New York University's newly finished Abu Dhabi satellite campus, which is now also on Saudi Yacht. The caption reads, migrant workers, in their tiny apartment in Abu Dhabi earn as little as $272 a month while building a campus for NYU. This day's edition of the International New York Times was not printed in the UAE. It was hidden from public view and not put on shelves. This news article and photograph are just the tip of the iceberg of what you can easily find online concerning Saudi Island. Poor working and living conditions continue to plague tens of thousands of immigrant workers who construct these buildings under dire conditions. This is a digital rendering of the upcoming Louvre Museum on Saudia Island. It is hard as a viewer to not have an opinion and judgment of the allegedly new art culture in the UAE because it is so fantastic and unheard of, one could say it is extreme. It's also easy to hide the highly problematic labor issues behind these kinds of images. The writing about contemporary art in the UAE that the public audience sees shows only the extreme poles of a bigger conversation. Museums and curators are hyper-positive, focusing nearly exclusively on the stunning visuals and projected plans for the Emirates. Meanwhile, news and media sources are bluntly critical of the UAE usually criticizing Dubai and Abu Dhabi specifically. In viewing this range of information, discourse matters as it creates the stepping stones that direct arts viewing audience, meaning the public at large, meaning ourselves. On the 
farthest right-hand side of the spectrum, you'll find Dubai Bashing. This fittingly titled page from one source calls together a selection of headlines that aggressively critique the Emirate, and in particular, its architecture. This page, Dubai Bashing, cites Sam Castles in the Sky, an article in which the writer and critic Philip Noble gives his opinion on the Vice President of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who is also the constitutional monarch of Dubai. In his article, Noble writes, he is the visionary ruler who responded to drying oil wells by remaking Dubai into a business and entertainment center, a corporate pied of terre, an oasis of capitalism between Europe and the East. Wall Street meets Las Vegas, meets Xanadu, on crack. <laughs> Dubai has also been called the likes of Disneyland and Lake City. On the opposite side of the spectrum is Louvre Abu Dhabi, birth of a museum, the monograph of the upcoming museum's collection. The discussions of financial ability and workers' rights are avoided as if this book's authors are allergic to these topics. A price tag cannot or will not be pinned to the edifying democratization of culture that the museum will undoubtedly provide. The book's rhetoric and careful discourse acts as a defense against criticism, while avoiding mentioning the actual criticism of the Emirates at all costs. This is a rendering of the exterior of the future museum which is absolutely stunning and has received critical acclaim for its design by the French architect Jean Nouvel. Please note, you might not be able to see it in this image, but there's a private boat that can drive you right up to the outside. In Birth of the Museum's introductory essays, of which there are several, the discourse of globalism and a collective human spirit spurs a fantastic vision with rhetoric to match that places art as a definition of and a defense for the country's validity amidst critique and judgment from every angle. One essay in Birth of the Museum reads, the museum born of the Arabian Peninsula in an ever-changing and increasingly globalized world aims to highlight shared human experience, transcending geography, nationality, and history. The spirit of universalism and exploration of commonalities over centuries is what this book and the museum hope to offer not only to the people of the UAE, but also to the world. The earlier criticisms that the journalists voiced, such as Dubai's skyline being on crack, are very intentionally not mentioned on this left side of the spectrum, as each essay in Birth of a Museum acts as self-evident proof of the merit of the UAE's art culture. Throughout the essays, the same phrases and keywords are cycled through and repeated. Universal, global, bridge, future, <coughs> generations, intercultural, and transnational. These phrases are constant. This is a picture of individuals looking at a scale model of the proposed Saudia Island. And you can see the, the, the white circle on the left. These two sides of the story clearly oppose each other. Okay. On the blue left-hand side of the spectrum, the individuals representing Sadiat's new museums paint a joyous picture of transnational harmony brought about by art in the UAE, sweeping all of the otherwise very apparent issues under the rug. Meanwhile, the journalists and media on the red right-hand side of the spectrum criticize the dirt under the rug and essentially only the dirt. In between these is where we find the middle ground. <clears throat> these middle ground sources give a holistic view of what is covered up, but are mostly academic critical writings. Select authors and art historians, such as Hans Belting, Emily Doherty, and Ahmed Khanna, actually do examine the so-called rug itself, poking at what is going on in the UAE now. While these sources give a fuller picture of the country in its global context, they are usually found as UAE-focused chapters in compendiums discussing global art or the Middle East. These writings and opinions are not intended for mass consumption and interpretation in the way that
at the left and right hand poles of the spectrum are. Moving beyond these extreme poles, a clear centered view shows that the language used in presenting the UAE's art developments is essential. It deliberately shapes how the public conceptualizes the country's reputation. As the public audience, does the information we receive encourage us to ignore or question the elephant in the room in this contemporary history? When approaching the topic of the UAE, we must consider the current complexities of Emirati lifestyle and local art culture within the context of global art collecting. And this is the rendering of the new Guggenheim by Frank Gehry. With this context in mind, we may lift up the rug and look under it with those authors who represent the area between the extremes in this conversation. By researching and reading beyond what is publicly available, we may see that the UAE's political language differs in purpose from other Western museums' art speak or use of art jargon because in its writing, the country addresses concerns of global recognition, reputation, and questions of motive and intent for its own future. By necessity, no part of this self-promotion and development is immune to rhetoric. This image by Micah's Associate Dean for Design and Media, Alexander Halner, is an unaltered photograph of the coastline of Dubai in 2008, showing the man-made palm-shaped islands off the Gulf Coast. Moving forward, critique of the UAE and its actions will undoubtedly continue, growing in intensity within the next few years as the planned museums become realities on Saudi Al Island. This cultural hub will change the art world, or at least the market, in some fashion. We will continue to be offered both poles of the spectrum, as each of us is really considered a part of the UAE's audience. We are the art-consuming public, certainly as tourists, but more widely as people of the world. Critically observing the way that these arts institutions move into the 21st century illuminates how we absorb new projects. How do the media, as well as our own standpoints, influence our opinions? What will happen when this projected cultural hub, currently visualized through digital renderings alone, becomes a reality? Because the region and the discussion surrounding it will continue to change and develop so quickly, a balanced reading beyond superlative analysis will yield the strongest critical standpoint for us as the UAE's audience. To conclude, there's one very comparable example of the dramatic potential of new museums as catalysts for culture. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, opened in 1997 in northern Spain, was designed by the star architect Frank Gehry and features a dramatically undulating metal exterior. The museum multiplied the area's tourism, quickly prompting millions of visitors and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for the previously sleepy city. This is a digital rendering of Gary's upcoming Guggenheim design for Sadia Island. Let us think beyond our own lifetimes for a moment. In considering the UAE's vigorously and impressively future-oriented visions, will the UAE truly become a global hub of art tourism at some point rivaling even New York or Paris. Only time will tell. Can the so-called Bilbao effect really work to awaken the UAE as a major arts destination? What will happen in a generation's time? Will the novelty of the Emirates, its architecture, and the supposedly new art culture there ever fade? Despite our contemporary understanding of the functionality of fine art, the tradition of art making has always been sociological and communicative. 
By recreating signs and symbols that are understood by all, humanity has been able to effectively communicate messages of religion, power, oppression, and celebration. These symbols rely on representational forms to express their message. Representational symbols, by their nature, are easily understood and related to the human experience. But does that mean that minimal and abstract works have any capacity to do the same? These images, while not necessarily as accessible or obviously democratic, do lend themselves to describing conditions of society and identity. Non-objective art upturned how we easily relate to representational images, but the sociological importance and context of these works is as powerful as any others. The beginnings of artists' endeavors to abstract reality trace back to the invention of photography and film. Painting and sculpture's purpose has been to memorialize stories. With the influx of mechanical reproduction, what purposes does these high art forms serve now? What makes painting and sculpture separate from the documentary nature of these new methods of image making? Benjamin argues in his 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the, the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, that what is lost in this technical progress is the aura of the art, the originality and physicality of an image which is not been reproduced. The presence of a physical work of art in the context of the growing mass media and Nazi propaganda of this time led Benjamin to believe that the authentic experience with an art object was something sacred and meaningful. Benjamin's concept of time and aura of a piece was different from his trepidation towards the speed of mechanical reproduction. The consumption of these types of mass-produced images had an unsettling potential to be used for political influence and gain. Art has been free from its use of ritual and religious motivation, but instead towards the agendas, turns towards the agendas of those in power who can manipulate its manufacture. Benjamin saw that while this was the status of photography and film, the power of, the power of individual and dissident thought lay in images and objects with unique existence as a direct experience of the work will encourage more thought without any, without any underhanded framing. Mass consumption, mass consumption changes the need from individual interpretation to universal understanding, and Benjamin sees the framing of these images as paramount to their message. Cult value dies with exhibit, and the exhibition value takes its place. Messages are made the sacred space of art, and because of the control of the wealthy integral to the capitalist system, we see messages of the powerful minority. Benjamin wishes to see these images politicized in revolutionary and Marxist ways, but the history of art is catered up to wishes of the wealthy dashes in the streets. From Benjamin's foresight of the politicized framing of artworks, the world continues to see a denial of the positive politicization of art. The context of images becomes even more important with the advent of images and objects which seem the least likely to enact social change. The minimalist and conceptualist art of the 1960s and beyond induction into the teachings of art history appear important to the understanding of these works that refuse to invite the viewer in with the representational politics of film and photography. Conceptual art relied on information, reintroducing a language that was non-visual into a visual culture. The abstract nature of this manifestation of information led to a visual and intellectual abstraction through form and metaphor, much influenced by the objective and scientific view of structuralist theory. This practice places the artist as medium through which information is conveyed, the artist as, acting as a microscope rather than binoculars. This new role for the artist comes at the empowerment and increased responsibility of the audience, leaving the art open to myriad interpretation and signaling the birth of the viewer as decider of meaning and worth. The meaning is now in the understanding, no longer in the artist's intention. Eve Metzler, in her 2013 text, Systems We Have Loved, argues that while the death of the author allowed for increased participation of the viewer, few deaths are emotionless. These new meanings re rely on the reaction and manifestation of emotion and thought in the viewer, and Metzler posits that despite a cold and uninviting exterior, conceptual art is just as emotional and subversive as art which panders to its viewer. Affect theory and anti-humanist structuralism, the backbones of Metzler's arguments, are seen as distant philosophies. One which asserts that art and experience always elicit a physiological reaction and emotion, and the other which denies intent of the author and deems art as a product of our species' ability to communicate within a system of signs and symbols. Conceptual art, a product of systematic thinking, relishes its abstraction of thought and acts within that regulatory process to present information in mechanical but also personal ways. Metzler argues that conceptual and structuralist thinking appeals to our senses without apparent agenda appeals to the inherent emotional nature of humanity in a way that leaves faith and room for the viewer to actively participate. Humanity, as it is wont to do, attempts to find meaning in anything that is given. 
where we are able to find meaning is up to us in our attempts to understand and relate to sorry, images. In its philosophically vague nature, successful conceptual and abstract art exceeds its systems because it calls upon the viewer's associations with a light touch of influence. The author is not dead, but is backed off considerably from their pulpit. Specifically because the responsibility is on the audience, the power of interpretation and meaning falls into the democratic hands of everyone who sees it, and participation and emotion become vital to the activation of any art. When we consider the effective and revolutionary potentials of being in the physical presence of an original artwork, the aim of capitalist culture becomes clear. When we commodify forms of expression, these thoughts and ideas fall under control of the powerful and can be modeled into reflections of the traditional structuralist and perhaps meaningless systems. The artist today finds themselves between two equally disagreeable spectrums of development. An artist can choose to work outside the paradigm of institutions but risk financial failure, or they can be swallowed up by a corrupt system which attempts to put a price tag on the ideas of individuals. Abstraction allows for agency through the manifestation of large ideas into eloquent metaf and metaphoric representations which are up to interpretation. This condensation of ideas merges with the same physiological agency of typical relational aesthetics. The artist who uses their presence acts in the same way as the artist who creates an object. Both present their opinions with through solidity, one more ephemeral than the other, both abstracts of conditions and thoughts. If we think of putting art to work, explaining or engaging participants in an abstract notion like democracy, we could, with more effort, turn this procedure around and consider what an abstraction like democracy might manifest like in physical or even aesthetic forms. How might the power of a thing, a physical presence which is unique in its creation and confident in its audience, inspire both aesthetic and sociological thinking? One artist whose work in life aggregates these disparate theories is the American artist Mark Bradford. Bradford was born in 1961 and received both his BFA and MFA from CalArts in the mid-1990s. His focus has been on celebrating his identity and the shared culture of this identity. Bradford, using, same, using paper in the same elemental and transformative way as paint, creates large abstract works which explore the personal and cultural history of a black, male, gay immigrant living in California. Simply by making art and showing it to others, he is subversive, reverent, and antagonistic towards the history of abstraction and conceptual art. He uses the same language and methods as his aesthetic forebears, but when not democratizes abstraction through the use of humble material, childlike method, individual identity, and his actions outside of his own art practice. Bradford's familial history is, was a progenitor of his process. Bradford's mother was the owner of a hair salon that catered to black women, and Bradford, from a young age, was involved in the business in making signs to advertise the salon. Bradford's 2002 Straw Variety examines the relationship between material, memory, and labor through the use of singular datum that culminate into a greater whole. The end papers using perms and colored advertisements allowed for a new way to relate to the history of abstract painting that was dominated by white men. Using a material that holds significant personal and cultural history to create images, Bradford argues for a space for everyday material through the exclusion of paint in his paintings. The application of sanding, collage and decollage, that comprises his process relates to the fluxing, na fluxing nature of the papers and advertising he collects, made for singular purpose or persuasions of limited time offers, only to be replaced by others. Importance of material references the conceptual, and the formal affect of this work is one of, this work is one of aged material, heat, mist, and repetition. There is a connection to romantic landscapes of the 19th century through the creation of atmosphere and sunset colors, reinforcing the connection to nostalgia and memory that the use of perm papers implies. The title, a nickname for a female crack-addicted prostitute, references the urban topography of these units and the specific feminine identity that does not have a loud voice in American society. Bradford speaks to the personal and cultural histories through this material and connects abstraction to marginalized identities. Bradford's work evolved over the next 10 years and began to mine the topographic nature of his process and his segmented and ordered images. Bradford's 2012 Father You Have Murdered Me, acquired by Brandeis University's Rose Art Museum the same year, is a touchstone in this new development, using the brightness of paper in different ways. By cutting the paper into smaller segments, Bradford molded it to his liking, controlling the size and shape to echo something that directly occurs in reality. This type of imagery recalls satellite images of urban areas, congestion of different structures viewed from afar. Bradford called upon our cultural familiarity with these types of images to make that leap 
between shreds of paper the urban environment. Using the shared visual language of signs and symbols as a way to create an affect of awe and intrigue. The distance from which these paintings are viewed is analogous to the geographic and sociological distance the viewer might have from this cultural experience of absentee fatherhood. Far away, the image overwhelms in its detail and scale, but close up there is luscious detail and seductive color that one lingers in. The painting's relationship to context, to what the image resembles, to the racial and familial implications of its title, and its place at the University Museum creates a situation where an abstract image situated amongst other abstract images suddenly becomes political because of its content and context. His presence in the show, which celebrated heroes like de Kooning, is subversive because of his identity, but rightfully earned on the powerful and masterful work. The painting vibrates at the same frequency as the changing identities and infrastructure of the conditions he portrays. Bradford's recent exhibition of the Rose continued this referential nature of his abstraction, but included information from cartography in a broader, more superficial sense and from the history of map making and travel. Titled Sea Monsters, this exhibition was built around the discovery of new lands via ocean passage in the 15th and 16th century and the information that was gathered this way. Specifically in his 2014 talk at the Rose, Bradford speaks about these sea monsters that were drawn into these new maps to thrill and scare explorers of the unknown world. Bradford's The Edge of Expansion overtly refers, overtly refers to this history of the expanding horizon to traveling across oceans to new places. This enticing painting glitters with silver, red, and orange, recreating the phenomenon of the surface of a body of water at sunset. This painting is both beautiful and artificial in its metallic surface and repetitious composition, and questions through its title and the context of Bradford's other work what exactly the edge of expansion is for the white European explorers. With the, with the desire to expand their influence, they traveled and raised lands which they claimed from others and subjugated those they presumed inferior to themselves to continue their conquest. This dark history of expansion and colonialism is a romantic and disastrous tale which is still controlled by the same groups of people who committed these crimes. In his abstraction, Bradford is able to sneak past any type of censorship to state his message in an effective, emotionally compelling, and formally beautiful statement. There is a hollowness to the beauty depicted, and this lack of substance is essential to Bradford's message of abstraction, of the types of perspectives and stories told within the gallery. In his 2012 talk at the Rose Art Museum about Father You Have Murdered Me, Bradford spoke about his time at CalArts, a school which places emphasis on the theoretical, and how that moved him to speak about his place as an artist in what he considered a post-studio world. Bradford's scavengings bring authenticity and originality to his practice of collecting paper and brings him into the world of cultures he depicts in his work. The material is not from a white cube, and thus it has connections to the outside world simply by virtue of its definition as paper. Bradford gives his work more authenticity because of his concern for social activism as well as through his foundation Art Plus Practice which embraces a twofold mission, to empower foster youth and to transform its community through the inspirational power of art. Bradford's history and identity push him to give others the same opportunities he has been given to engage in the public art discourse that is so often dominated by money and the elite. Bradford's mission to empower youth through art education and activism makes him a unique and fearsome identity in the art world. His causes and art mirror each other through their philosophy and subversion, and while he must rely on this system to survive as a as a provider of non-commercial culture, Bradford sees himself as an artist with a mission that is outside the studio and gallery and acts as a voice in art and society at large. In summary, Bradford uses abstraction in ways which subvert the capitalist white art system through connections to material, identity, cultural history, and activism. The agency of abstraction is strengthened by its physical presence as an object, something which relates to human scale and the body in effective ways. In participating in the larger commercial system, Bradford has agency to change it and to spread his efforts into art making and social activism. When abstraction is taken into the hands of someone with a, with a social mission like Bradford, it can be used to further that age agenda because of its malleability. Abstraction can be a powerful tool that acts within the system it wishes to change. Thank you. Diana Vasquez is currently a senior at the University of Massachusetts Law. She majors in history, liners in art, history, and French. She has always had a passion for art history and has recently gained a new appreciation for the democratic aspect of street art as a whole. Upon graduating, she hopes to join in a work field that will allow her to merge her passion in the arts in the legal field, 
possibly going into property. And so that further ado. paper was on Pope Ives and title Post Graffiti and is on the how the art world and market reacted to the graffiti movement of the early 1980s and John Michel Basquiat's role as a catalyst of this relationship. So um, trends in the arts have always coincided with the social and economic trends of the times. It can be said that one can see a direct reflection of what was coveted and abandoned by looking at <clears throat> the artworks that were being produced during the time. <clears throat> This can exclusively be said about graffiti and New York City in the 1980s. Graffiti is a unique and democratic form of art that allows one to display their work to a guaranteed audience. In the early 80s, the art world and art market began to embrace this graffiti and turned it into a kind of commodity. Between the years of 1979 and 1984, New York galleries like the Fun Gallery and the prestigious Sidney Janis Gallery had shows that showed exclusively graffiti work. Impactful shows such as the New York New Wave show at the PS1 show will reflect the populist movement of the times. This transition from street to canvas marks a pivotal point in not only New York art culture, but in the international art market as well. John Michel Basquiat is a reflection of the formation of this unique relationship between street art and gallery culture. His journey from Samo van der Ven to one of the highest selling um, artists of the time coincides with the attitudes and response to new neo-expressionists in the market. By delving into Basquiat's reception by museums such as the MoMA during the time, one can see how the street's populist movements, such as graffiti, can be fully embraced in galleries and shows while completely rejected by larger institutions. <laughs> New York City was less of a cosmopolitan mecca as it's known today back in the early 80s. The job market took a significant hit during the decade due to American companies moving out of the country and New York City lost more than 40,000 jobs. Some boroughs, including Brooklyn and the Bronx, were home to the poorest areas in the country. Many of those moving to Manhattan, according to the documentary The Radiant Child, were younger, alternative creatives. The borough was affordable, if you can believe that, and allowed artists to be accessible to one another. This led to a unique nightlife scene that seemed to always center around a form of art. It, is, it set the perfect scene for graffiti artists to begin to flourish and become a vital part of the culture. Graffiti symbolized a very loud break from tradition, certainly a break from the traditional art of the decade before. Art critic Rene Ricard described graffiti style as in the city's blood and so much a part of this town. According to Ricard, those making graffiti in New York City were actually second generation graffiti artists. He writes in his article, The Radiant Child, centered on the Jean Michel Basquiat, that graffiti has always been around in the way that we recognize it now for about 10 years. And whether one considers it this a long or short time, it is already in, in its second generation. The whole motivation behind graffiti is this idea of fame and recognition. This lies in the tags that the artist leaves behind. There is no anonymity in graffiti, no question of who did what. It's a very populist art movement that involves no exclusivity. Most can afford the tools needed to create the work, and their mediums were not limited by the ideas of indoor space. A significant place for graffiti in New York City was the subway. It provided a kind of democratic space as a range of people used public transport with a built-in audience. Graffiti was described as loud, demanding, and even impulsive, impulsive, according to New York Times writer Grace Blue. Her article, On Canvas, Yes, But Still an Eyesore, is a reflection of the idea that graffiti was more of a teenage phenomenon than a legitimate art movement. It was anything but permanent and nothing more than a passing fad to critics like Blue. There was even a discussion that neo-expressionism as a whole was a time-sensitive fad and doomed to a short life because of the nature of the art. Times writer Kathleen McGowan would disagree with Blewett's commentary of, of graffiti as visual mayhem. She states in her article that graffiti and neo-expressionism allowed the art world to heat up after a lull of nearly a decade. Prior to the neo-expressionist movement, the minimalist movement was predominant. Here we have an image of Donald Judd's untitled um, the concept of minimalism is typically understood by a more inclusive audience. The work done by these artists usually involved a gallery, a museum, a lot of white walls. Unlike minimalist art, graffiti can be used as a direct response to daily life. Minimalism was more intellectual and academic and required a kind of background knowledge to truly experience. According to Basquiat himself, minimalism tended to alienate those people from art. Graffiti directly combated, combated this idea and came as a shock when displayed in galleries. 
A common style for a graffiti artists trying to bring their art into the gallery was the Fun Gallery. Opened in 1981 by Patty Astor, the Fun Gallery was a reflection of the downtown scene and managed to provide a space for graffiti artists to take their work inside to be showcased and sold. In an interview, Patty stated that she did not see a difference between graffiti writers and artists and wanted to, through showing, dis showing displays at the gallery, show that there is a diversity between graffiti artists. A pivotal show for graffiti in the early 80s was the New York New Wave show at PS1 in 1981. Curator Diego Cortez, who was one of the first purchasers of Basquiat's art, comments that the show was in direct opposition to the white walls, white people, and white lines shown at typical gallery shows. And here we have this draft list for the artists um, in the show, most of which, aside from well, Andy Warhol's up there, but most were brand new artists to the scene. It was one of Basquiat's first organized shows. In December 1983, the Sydney Janus Gallery produced a month-long exhibition entitled Post Graffiti. The prestigious gallery is known for giving Jackson Pollock his first three shows, and it can be said that it's known for promoting avant-garde artists. Post Graffiti included the work of Keith Haring, Lady Pink, and Jean-Michel Basquiat. The show included 18 other graffiti artists who were encouraged to put their work on campus. The aforementioned New York Times article by Grace Lewick slammed the majority of artists taking place in the show as too impulsive and only in it for the thrill of seeing their name in lights. Only two artists were exempt from the harsh review, Keith Haring and Basquiat. Lewick stated that the two were more calculating and moderate than the wild style graffiti artists and should therefore, therefore be held to a higher standard. Both Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat emerged into New York City art scene by doing graffiti style work. They both surpassed the use of street art by firmly making their way into galleries and eventually selling their work all around the world. Keith Haring began using blank black advertising spaces in the subway stations to produce simple bold line pieces, such as his familiar tag, The Radiant Baby. Throughout his career, his street art helped him gain the role as a bridge between the, art, the world of art and ideas and the main streets of New York City. Basquiat began gaining attention by his alternate graffiti writing ego, Samo, an acronym for, sorry for the language, same old shit, with partner Al Diaz. Same old works were usually painted were usually spray painted phrases or sentences on buildings and subway trains. The work of Samo dif differed significantly with the typical graffiti of the time. It seemed to transcend tagging to provide a commentary on the art world itself. Jordana Morsegui suggests that the particular phase, Samo as an end to plain art, was positioning Samo as an alternative to the commercial art world. Ironically, Samo is what initiated the road for Basquiat to become such an important part of the very same art world. When Basquiat went on to participate in exhibitions and have solo shows, many critics defended his same old past by really emphasizing the historical references in his work. Much of the work that Basquiat produces cites famous fine arts such as the Mona Lisa and works from Picasso. His painting process tended to be intellectually fueled as well. He commonly put texts and phrases on his canvases, similar to the ones that he produced as same old. In one review on a show at the Mary Boone Gallery in 1985, an art critic stated that while Basquiat did begin with Samo, his work is different from the defacers who over the last decade moved from exhibitionism in the subways to exhibitions and galleries. The intellectual edge that Basquiat had helped legitimize him as more than just a defacer in the eyes of critics. It helped him transcend the genre of graffiti and enter the realm of neo-expressionism. There was a shift in the art market during the 80s as well that worked in favor of artists like Basquiat. It was a time when art pieces were starting to be sold for what was considered to be outrageous prices. The commercial art market began to impact the art world as a whole. These new attitudes about what art is truly worth played a part in the embrace of alternative artists such as Basquiat. In an article written in 1983, also by Grace Gluck, entitled, When Money Talks, What Does It Say About Art? discusses what was then a new way of looking at art as another form of currency. She writes, the number of single transactions of purchasing art is in the several millions of dollars, and the increasingly common view of art as a highly tradable commodity is more apparent. These attitudes of, towards art raise different kinds of questions that directly deal with our experience as a viewer. For example, Gluick questions whether high prices and their attendant publicity tend to interfere with our aesthetic experience of the work. Do they, to some degree, allow the function of uh, allow cause the price of the function to, as 
I'm sorry, to affect the judgment of our own. And very often we are bullied into ju doing just that. The new commercial angle of, art will, of the art world would also encourage the industry of galleries. Seguise writes that there were 73 galleries in 1979, but by 1985, the list inclined to almost 450. The demand for new art compared to a decade before marks the 80s art market as producing an unquenchable demand for something new. Artists such as Basquiat, Herring, or graffiti as Kenny Sharp, once seized upon, became overnight sensations. In understanding the aforementioned demand Basquiat experienced, it is important to know what set him apart from the rest. Basquiat's uniqueness in not only the art he was producing, but as a figure breaking ground in the art world in that moment. Basquiat was a patient of Puerto Rican descent, instantly setting himself far apart from the high-selling artists of the time. In most reviews, there was a mention of his ethnicity and his street upbringing in Brooklyn. In an article written in 1983, Basquiat was referred to as Haitian boy wonder raised in the subway. Basquiat was referred to as the Black Picasso as his style is described as primitive and deliberately naive. It was a far cry from the intellectual appeal of art in the previous decade. He, was also, he also centered many of his works on the black body and prominent black figures such as Sugar Ray Robinson, as he believed they weren't focused enough throughout art history. There has always been a kind of disconnect between the major art world and African American art. Um, as Seguise writes, African Americans have faced confinements and limitations in the visual arts. Most have failed to capture the complex range of the black identity. Basquiat was truly putting forth something revolutionary. However, what made him so special to the art culture is also what ostracized him, and he felt the weight of prejudice heavily throughout his career, no matter how famous he got. In a review of his work written in 1984, Vivian Raynor writes, right now Basquiat is a very promising painter who has a chance of becoming a very good one as long as he can withstand the forces that would make him an art world mascot. Part of this has to do with the celebrity figure that came with his title. The celebrity also helped drive up the, com the commercial work of commercial worth of his work in the short amount of time he was on the scene. The first mention of the artist in the New York Times was a small advertising um, small advertising for an oil painting in 1981. Just two years later, he was getting full page articles dedicated to his marketability. In 1983, the average sale of his work increased by 600%. The pace of the market reflected the pace of the times, and it allowed artists like Herring and Basquiat to have their hands fir firmly placed planted in marketing fashion shows and galleries. Herring was involved in designing bottles for Absolute Vodka while Basquiat was appearing on MTV regularly. It seemed that while the multiple outlets that embraced these artists, major art institutions were hesitant to accept them. Both the Whitney and the Museum of Modern Art in New York re refused the work of Basquiat in the early 80s. The MoMA initially stated that he wasn't worth the space, and today MoMA owns 11 of his works. The larger art institutions take more time to accept something as radically different as graffiti and neo-expressionism, and this shows the divide between the <coughs> art market and traditional art culture. Thank you. We'll be kind to have about one question for each person, so if anyone's interested in asking any questions for Drew and Fer, we'd love to take them now. Um, if not, we can move on to Daphne. Actually, we've. Um, oh, sorry, I have a question for Drew, actually, um, regarding for the art object. Um, so, it seems within your talk that you were referring to fur as something that was more of an extension of the body, uh, something that really um, calls to the identity of the person. So, how. I don't know, can you hear me? Or I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, how should we perceive fur um, in relation to other art objects that we find in various spaces? Is there more of a connection to the human body um, with its deterioration? Um, Great. So I guess there's two things there. Um, one being that, oh, yeah, sorry. I guess there's two things there. One being that other objects, you have this object, right? You can look at the object. And this is the issue with fur and garments. I mean, there, there are literally none. Um, it's sort of why this investigation is by way of material and materiality. And so what are the effects, are the effects of this material? Um, sorry, what's the? question again. Oh, just, just in regards to uh, how, how, how Oh, it relates to the body. Yes. I think for me, what it really speaks to, I mean, like, fur is this very visceral mammalian thing. Um, and just beyond wearing it, how that affects you, it is somehow intimately related to the body. And throughout uh, Christian Europe and even in Scandinavia, there are numerous monsters and information where you know, people for various reasons or like very misogynistic or whatever, but they have to deal with these people spreading the fur, and there's this constant tension between sort of this three and logics almost of like where the human and the animal sit and where this can be conceptualized. And so there's definitely some uncomfortable in there. Um, yeah, I guess so 
announcer for Big question for you, then. Uh, I mean, I'm so interested in street art, and I'm always taken by this particular moment in New York in the set, late 70s, early 80s, because there is a weird symmetry where the assimilation of street art into the museum coincides with the gentrification of the city in almost perfect terms. And there's a real temptation to read this in terms of the following narrative that, okay, street art is assimilated, any sort of revolutionary potential is deflated in the process and therefore it loses its credentials on the street and it almost becomes this product of a of grand design. You can go, go too far with it. But it is striking, you know, if you watch like Style Wars, the documentary of street art at the time, um, how much street art there is versus today. I mean, my students are just shocked to see an entire subway car completely covered, interior and exterior. Um, you will not see that in New York today, right? Um, and so the larger kind of social process of gentrification, which almost feels like too mild of a word to describe what happened in, in Manhattan, in some way, perhaps maybe parallels this assimilation of street art into the museum. And, and I know that's a, a nice, neat, cozy narrative, and, and you want to avoid those, but do you think there's any credibility to reading it in, in, in that way? And what is the relationship between the larger transformation of the city that happens at this moment and this narrative of street art. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very tempting. It's definitely the direction I wanted to go in. I wish I could. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely what I found most interesting is that I guess all that street art stands for and that graffiti stood for once it became adopted by this kind of this this art culture, this white art culture, um, it lost. It almost like lost, you know, any kind of validity. 
sense. So I agree, I think there definitely is a parallel with um, the idea of, I think they go hand in hand, that idea of gentrifying and then like taking this like point, like I'll look at the subway and like take me inside of a museum selling for thousands of dollars. Like, there's, there's apps, I, I agree. Our first speaker will be Catherine Carlotto. She is a 2003 UMass Dartmouth alumni with a bachelor's degree in art history and a bachelor of fine arts degree in illustration. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in art history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst where she is majoring in modern architecture and minoring in medieval studies. 